Hello and welcome to Iron Africa here on France 24. I'm Fraser Jackson. Here are the stories making headlines across the continent this evening. Two years since Tunisian President Kais Sayed suspended Parliament and sparked accusations of a power grab. We'll have a report from our correspondents on the ground who tell us where the situation stands now. Zimbabwe is gearing up for an election in one month's time, but rising inflation could affect the way the vote goes and upset the status quo. And dozens of people have been killed by wildfires across Algeria. But days in, firefighters are continuing to battle the flames as residents take stock of what they've lost. But first, it has now been two years since Tunisian President Kais Sayed suspended Parliament and extended his executive powers in a move he said was in the interest of the country, but that his opponents called a power grab. Sayed eventually dissolved the Parliament whilst he called for a new constitution to be drafted up, something which was adopted following a vote marked by low voter turnout, deepening the country's political crisis. France 24's Fadil Alareza tells us where we are today. Despite record temperatures around 50 degrees this Tuesday, the National Salvation Front Opposition Coalition gathered nearly 200 activists to denounce the political and economic policies of President Kais Syed. Politically, there's been a total destruction of legal institutions, elected institutions, which had always been independent. Tunisian society is being impoverished. The economic crisis, long underway before President Syed took full powers, has gotten worse since, with food shortages and inflation regularly near 10 percent. Yet the July 25th movement, a pro-Syed coalition, defends his approach. Is it really possible to resolve all the economic problems and eradicate corruption in only two years? It's more important that we put in place a new political system. Near downtown Tunis, Abir Moussi, president of the right-wing Free Destourian Opposition Party, gathers her supporters. She refuses to protest with other opposition parties because of the presence of Islamists who were part of the governing coalitions for 10 years until 2021. We officially refuse to join hands with those who participated in the destruction of the country. We're in this situation today because of them. The opposition remains divided and struggling to mobilize, as they were two years ago. Leaders in civil society have denounced what they see as increasing attacks on freedoms and human rights. There's been a recent uptick in attacks on black migrants by security forces. Some were left in the desert border near Libya without food, water or shelter, and bodies were later discovered there. Our struggle is actually twofold. It's against this political rhetoric and the supporters of Kay Said, but also against a society that unfortunately has internalized racist rhetoric. Several NGOs have raised the alarm at the country's repressive shift, but despite this mixed record, President Syed is still popular in polls. The opposition party in Kenya says it's gathering evidence on police brutality to take to the International Criminal Court. It comes after the opposition called for widespread protests in recent weeks, which resulted in violent clashes between protesters and police. The brutality has been condemned by rights groups, but now the opposition is going further, using inflammatory rhetoric and saying that the police were targeting ethnic communities. Take a listen. We are witnessing unprecedented police brutality. We are also witnessing an unprecedented phenomenon of the state resorting to armed militia to quell protests. You have visited hospitals and morgues and you have established that police and hired gangs have shot and killed or wounded scores of people at close range. In these protests, the police are partisan, they have ethnic formations, and they are pursuing an ethnic agenda. That is why we believe we are in the formative stages of, a, of a genocide and political persecution sanctioned by the state, like happened to the Jews in Germany. Well, Kenya's interior minister has dismissed the opposition's claims as, quote, malicious, false and intended to distort public opinion, adding that police forces have remained, quote, neutral, impartial and professional. President Ruto also saying that he is ready to meet the opposition at any time. 
Well, in other news, there's now just one month to go before Zimbabwe heads to the polls. Twelve candidates are in the race, but incumbent Emerson Ngagwa is likely to face off against Nelson Chamisa from the Citizens Coalition for Change. The vote is taking place amid rampant inflation that could sway people's decisions. Shirley Sipon has a look ahead. They may be cheering, but Zimbabwe's main opposition supporters have been struggling to campaign. Their candidate, Nelson Chamisa, wearing the party's trademark color yellow, is thrilled to address his supporters at last. Dozens of the Citizens' Coalition for Change public meetings have been banned. Opposition figures have been arrested. And even supporters trying to hand out flyers have been stopped from doing so by police. We want to distribute flyers, but we are being blocked by the police. We want people to know opposition candidates, and we want to be freed from this suffering. Right now, we do not even have running water. Power outages, poverty and massive inflation, an annual 175 percent, are some of the main reasons many voters want change. Chamisa has vowed to clamp down on corruption. But Zimbabwe has a history of tainted elections, and many fear the vote may not be free and fair. Come election day, we're well, in for another disputed election. It's history repeating itself, sadly and regrettably. Ruling party ZANU-PF has been in power for 40 years. Its current candidate, Emerson Nangagwa, took over after Robert Mugabe was ousted. Zimbabwe must be food secure. We must be food secure. ZANU-PF has had a positive result on the food front. Zimbabwe is self-sufficient as far as wheat is concerned for the first time since 2004, a result that may bring out voters in rural areas where the party is particularly popular. At least 16 people have been killed by fresh airstrikes in Sudan as factions loyal to the country's two top generals continue to clash. After 100 days of war, almost 4,000 people have been killed by the violence. The latest airstrikes come just 24 hours after the rebel RSF forces spokesperson told a meeting in Togo that it was time for peace in Sudan. Take a listen. Yeah, we are looking for peace, like uh, the Sudanese people looking for peace. Sudanese people suffered from war for decades, like in the regions, in Darfur, in Blue Nile, in South Sudan, in East Sudan, and now in the capital, in Khartoum. So this is the time to end the war and start a new future for Sudanese people, peace, development, justice, equality, and that's what we're looking for, and I think it's the time to, for, for peace in Sudan. Firefighters in Algeria are continuing to tackle a series of wildfires that have devastated vast patches of land in the country. At least 34 people have been killed by the flames, with those who fled for their lives now left to take stock of what they've lost. Shirley Sipon has the story. This road and the forest around it were engulfed by wildfires only hours ago. The blazes spread quickly due to strong winds. The people fleeing in those cars were surrounded by flames, and witnesses say that unable to escape, they died. There were five people here. The man was coming to help. And in this car, there was a family of seven members from Algiers. A father, a mother, and their children. May God have mercy on them. This northern coastal area of Algeria, the mountains of the Kabylia region, has faced roughly 100 fires this summer, and firefighters have put out most of them. Among the victims, some 10 soldiers trapped in their base. This family of farmers was fortunate to flee their home and find refuge, but they have lost everything they owned. The fire jumped from one place to another. I never saw such flames. We ran. We first ran outside from this door, but the tree caught fire. Then the door exploded, and we ran from the other side and went to our neighbor's house. 
Algeria battles fires every summer due to the dry tinder and extreme temperatures. Authorities purchased more means to monitor and put out fires this year, but not enough to avert this destruction. Since emerging out of South Africa's townships in the 60s and 70s, the genre of dancing and whistling known as pansula has fallen out of fashion. But one dance company is looking to keep the tradition alive. Kami Nedelec reports. Frenetic footwork and precise movements. This is Pantsula, a dance that emerged from the black neighborhoods of apartheid-era South Africa. The dance was a vehicle for political resistance in which township life, everything from playing dice to fleeing police, became choreography. Is Pantsula, it's a, it's a South African township culture. It's, it's a culture, and on its own, in the culture, we have uh, our way of living. We've got our fashion, we've got our music, and um, we also have dance. Several of the dancers of dance troupe Via Katlehong credit Pantsula with keeping them out of trouble in their youth. But the genre fell out of favour in recent years as other more modern dances took over. The group is hoping to champion its renaissance with an international tour and have found some success at home as well. I'm happy that it's being revived now. The world will be mesmerised now and in a nice way. Named after the township they're from, for over 30 years the troupe has also mixed gumboot influences and other forms of South African dance, while staying true to their Pantsula heritage. And finally, on a personal note, uh, I just want to say goodbye. I'll be leaving the studios here in Paris to go and be France 24's new correspondent in Washington, D.C. I want to say that the people who work here on Iron Africa are some of the best and most talented journalists that I've ever had the honour of working with. To our team of correspondents, our producers, presenters and the team in the gallery, thank you for letting me be part of this family. And thank you at home for watching. I'll see you soon here on France 24. But until then, have a good evening. <laughs>